Episode 159 of CVP Cast with guest Dimitri Nustruk, recorded July 18th, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by PVS Studio, one of the most powerful static analyzers for your C, C++, and C Sharp source code. PVS Studio will let you detect errors and potential vulnerabilities at the earliest stage. Try the demo version today at viva64.com. In this episode, we discuss coroutines and jitting C++. Then we talk to Dimitri Nostra. Dimitri talks to us about classic design patterns with modern C++. Welcome to episode 159 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing good. Uh, we were just talking about your C++ Now coming episodes. Do you want to share what you're working on? Uh, oh, my C++ Weekly episodes? Yeah, C++ Weekly, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, did you... you, you <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's I didn't expect you to uh, to ask that since we I okay, um, so I sent out a Twitter poll and I said which way do you prefer to return from a function if it's um, multiple return paths or a single return path, mm-hmm. and um, I got like 880 responses to the poll. Oh, wow. I think it's like the most expensive Twitter poll I've done, and that's with I think only one retweet. It's just like my regular Twitter followers responding to it. Hmm. Um. But yes, so my next episode of C++ Weekly, which will be on Monday, as they always are, is going to say that there is actually only one right answer to this question. So that should provoke uh, some, some internet trauma. Yes, um, yes, we will see what happens. <laughs> okay, it'll be interesting to, to uh, watch that video and see what the answer is. <laughs> oh, I, I guess before we move on from, well, that, I guess, yeah. talks and such... Um, I did get two talks accepted for CPPCon. Awesome. Um, and uh, just a reminder, since I haven't mentioned it in a time, I am doing the, one of the two-day trainings after CPPCon. Right, you're doing one of the post-training classes. Okay. One of the post-training, uh, one of those post-conference training classes. Yeah. So um, people should sign up for that. It yeah, is on I think- C++ best practices. And are we already past early bird registration for CPPCon? I forget. Um, it might. Oh, I don't know. They they scheduled the early bird registration to end after the results were sent so that people who had submitted talks could still get early bird. But I don't know if that's still going or not. You know, I, I'm looking at a post saying early bird registration ends this weekend, and that was posted uh, on July 6th. So I think it is over. But everyone should still go ahead and register and, and look into some of these pre and post conference classes if you haven't already. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think early bird affects the class prices. I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's just the conference registration itself. Yeah. yeah. And if you happen to live in the Bellevue area and aren't going to CVPCon, you're still welcome to attend one of the classes. It's true. Yep. Okay. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Shalom saying, uh, Hi, Robin Jason. After having become addicted to the show, I've been working my way through the entire archive. It's absolutely amazing how much C++ has changed since you started the podcast, and yet so much remains relevant, even in the cutting edge. Listening has been mm. a blast, and alternating between new episodes and older ones really underlines how much the show has improved technically, while the content <laughs> has maintained the same excellence of quality throughout. Thanks for making the show, and keep it coming. Uh, I'm glad to hear that I think we have Im- improved uh, technically. I know we, we got through a couple hurdles in the early episodes with pen clicking and, and noise and things like that. <laughs> why, why does the pen clicking thing keep coming up? No well, one has mentioned it in that. years. I know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm glad you uh, enjoy the old episode. It, we, we do have a decent archive now. And I never thought about this, how much the language has changed. We fully covered the move to C++ 17. Yeah, I mean, C++ 14 was still fresh when we started the show. Well, still fairly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, part of the difference is um, 
how how quickly organizations are starting to learn that they need to like you know stay up to date basically yeah now with all the training i've done lately i know that there's lots of organizations that are limited by other things like if you're producing a product that's going into third party distribution in some mm-hmm. way you're going to be limited by whatever compilers they say you're allowed to use on the hardware that they're requiring you to write for and that's holding a lot of people back but people that have control over their own tool chains they are really trying to stay up to date yeah well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, those do help us find more listeners. So please send us a review if you listen to us on iTunes. Uh, joining us today is Dimitri Nustruk. Dimitri is a quantitative analyst, developer, course, and book author, and an occasional conference speaker. His interests lie in software development and integration practices in the areas of computation, quantitative finance, and algorithmic trading. His technological interests include C-sharp and C++ programming, as well as high-performance computing using technologies such as CUDA and FPGAs. Dimitri, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. Dimitri, with all this talk about conferences lately, and and in we were just discussing a few minutes ago off air um, that w- I last saw you at C++ Now. Are you planning to go to any upcoming C++ conferences? No, no, I'm not. To be honest, after five and a half years of uh, nonstop traveling around the world, I'm giving it a break. It's now been two years where uh, the only travel I'm doing right now is maybe going to the Canaries for some extra sun. That's pretty much it. So no conferences for me for now, but I'm already kind of missing it a little bit maybe. But uh, I guess one of the key differences, and this is going to sound really cynical, but one of the key differences is that uh, back when I was an evangelist, somebody paid for all those trips, and now <laughs> I, I gotta like I gotta be very selective here. But I I wouldn't I wouldn't discount the uh, the idea of going to some conferences at some point in time. But at the moment, since it's not part of my job, it's a lot a lot more difficult to even prepare a talk because I'm busy with other things. Right, makes sense. There, there's well, some I guess fairly large conferences in Europe. I mean, there's meeting C plus plus and C plus plus Russia, right? Yeah, yeah, the, those are there, and and also I go to. Well, I did go to a .NET conference recently, and I do visit the uh, user group meetings on the .NET side here okay. from time to time, and even some C plus plus events, which also a uh, very active C plus plus user group here. Now that my colleague Anastasia, who you've also had on the show, she is now uh, coordinating the activities of the local C plus plus user group, and there's like meeting after meeting there, so <laughs> I I can't. Can't keep up with all of this. Well, okay. Well, Dimitri, we have a, a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking to you more about uh, design patterns and the the book you put out recently. Okay. Sure. Okay. So this first one is a post on uh, the Absale blog from Titus, and it's about coroutine types. And when I first uh, saw this article, I, I knew that you know we have discussed this alternate coroutine proposal that someone from Google is working on, and I thought Titus was kind of going to be advocating that and comparing the, the Google coroutines with uh, Gore's coroutines, uh, but it's not really about that. He he mentions uh, the Google alternative proposal, but he's really talking about uh, the task class and how it I guess doesn't really match what he sees as uh, other you know, standard library class conventions. Yeah. Honestly, I wasn't able to get into this article as much as I would have liked to have. Um, well, personally, yeah. I, I see that the, there is a, a great parallel between this and uh, what's going on in .NET, and I hate mm-hmm. to redirect things to other languages, but essentially okay. this road has already been traveled in the .NET space, and there is this async await paradigm that's already been kind of tested out and implemented, and even the name of the class is the same, so we have the task class in, in the TPL in the .NET space, which actually is what effectively wraps a unit of work. And one important thing that sort of com- comes to mind as I think about this is the ability to control the thread on which a continuation actually happens. And the reason why this is important, and I'm sure that people in the C++ world will hit this sooner or later, is because sometimes you have constraints. So, for example, you uh, you might have a user interface thread, and then you want the continuations to happen on this particular thread. And in actual fact, in the c language, there is explicit support for this paradigm, and there is a lot of 
uh, there is a lot of dark magic around this because you you can you can trip certain uh, uh, you you can hit certain traps and they they would sort of catch you off guard as you sort of transition from sort of one unit of work to another. So this would be an interesting area to watch out for in the C plus plus space as well. Yeah, I, I was also thinking about this and, and comparing it with what I know about TAS and async await and .NET. And one thing that Titus points out is if you return a task uh, from a coroutine function and you don't call coawait on it, the task doesn't do anything. Um, it doesn't, you know, start executing. And I know that's, I, I don't believe that's the way it works in .NET. If no, you no, re return a task, it, it is executing and you can kind of check its state and you don't necessarily ever need to call a wait on it. You can check its state and, you know, later on checking, see that it's done yeah, exactly, and get a result yes. from it. And that doesn't seem to be the way the C++ coroutines are going to work with Gore's proposal. Well, having a no op is just a really unintuitive approach, I think, because yeah. uh, what the, I mean, you want if if somebody uh, returns a task of t, you really want to give the caller the option to either call this synchronously or asynchronously. That seems like like the most sensible approach. So having a no op in this case instead is just just very bizarre, to be honest. Yeah, so maybe some more thought should go into this uh, as Titus is advocating for. Okay. Uh, next article is uh, Easy JIT, and this is a library that brings just-in-time compilation to C++ code. Interesting, we're just talking about uh, the .NET comparison, and that's obviously something they have in .NET. Um, but I thought this looked pretty interesting. Uh, I've never thought of having JIT in C++, um, and the way they're doing it is uh, kind of interesting. You need to kind of hook into the compiler, I guess, in order to yep. do this. Yeah. Yeah, I think once again, uh, what people really need is some sort of compiler API. And by that, I mean a generic compiler API that's part of maybe the standard library interface so that roughly speaking, what you could do at runtime is take an STD string, for example, at runtime and then ask the compiler to uh, basically uh, you you make a program from that string. You compile that program to, let's say, a dynamic library. Maybe it's an in-memory dynamic library. You load that library, and you get a pointer to the function that you just compiled. And in actual fact, if once again, coming back to other languages, we've had this functionality in Java from the earliest versions of Java, just being able to compile Java within Java. And, of course, c -sharp does it as well. On the C++ side, you do get this from CUDA, of all places. So, for example, if you want to compile a program for the GPU right from inside an already running C or C++ program. You can do this. You can actually invoke the compiler through the compiler API, but that's that's possible only because there is just one CUDA compiler. There isn't a myriad of different compilers like we have in C++. I think um, a, a potential pitfall to getting the standardized, something like the standardized for C++ would be uh, that not all hardware platforms that are supported by C++ would this even be possible on, because you mm -hmm. can't execute code from read-write memory and, and that kind of thing, depending on the platforms. Yes, and, and furthermore, I mean, when you're compiling, you're compiling with a certain set of flags which might yield a different result. And we already have this, you know, in, in numerics, for example, you compile for different uh, C++ compilers and you find out that you have to have different epsilon values on different uh, platforms because the way that the floating point calculations are compiled is not uniform. It's not, not exactly one for one. Right. Okay. And then Jason, do you want to introduce this last one about uh, no accept and const expert tools? Yeah, I just saw this uh, question on Reddit whether or not there was any tools that allow you that will tell you if a function could be constexpr or no accept. And I thought that's a great question. I actually had a student, um, a student who worked at a particular company that's used to doing lots of tooling around C++ that actually, uh, in one of my classes, wrote a quick program that was able to tell you if a function could be constexpr, which hmm. I thought was pretty impressive. Um, but I don't know if that ever will ever become public. So I, I definitely had an interest in this, and it's an interesting discussion on Reddit, but the main fallout for me here is that there are already static analysis rules in Visual C++ that will tell you if a function could be constexpr, could be called as constexpr, and can tell you if something should or could be no except. Yeah, so that's, uh, is that part of the core guidelines, or is that just existing C++ warnings? 
Oh, just um, some of it falls out of core guidelines. Yeah. So I think another area where uh, obviously tool support uh, people should jump in here and uh, all those static analyzers like Reshop or C++ or uh, you know the the equivalent tools they should be able to somehow uh, navigate through this. But personally, I think that whenever you go into the territory of um, analyzing a a particular trait out of a potentially infinite set of invocations, because here you have to traverse the whole call tree and so on. You, In many cases, you end up with a situation which is almost unresolvable. So for me, for example, one of the things that I would want to have in, in a you know, in a, hypothetically, is a feature which would tell me for a given calculation what tolerance should I compare floating point values with. And it turns out that this is uh, a rocket science kind of problem. It's not a problem where you can, you can just go ahead and solve. You can solve it on a simple example, like you add 0.1 and 0.2, you know their floating point representation. So when you compare them to 0.3, you know the tolerance more or less, you know the epsilon. But in the general case, what you end up doing is you end up fiddling these values. So it's kind of like an experimental procedure. It's like you're performing experiments on your code before you actually put it into production, which for me was always, you know, it's it's one of those things I don't like because I, I do like experimenting on, you know, actual data, say market data, for example, but experimenting on compiler output just for the sake of you know, fiddling these values, it, it seems very painful. But unfortunately, at least in my case, I don't think there is a, uh, a possible solution for this at all because it's just too complicated. Uh, but for uh, the const, specifically, I mean, going back to the article, for the const expert case, um, knowing whether or not a function can be const expert, this is something that every compiler already has to implement because in C17, the call operator on a lambda is const expert if it meets all the requirements of being const expert. So every every compiler that supports C17 has to have the capability of analyzing a function to know if it can be const expert. Just mm -hmm. have to call that on every function instead of just on lambdas and then uh, spit out that analysis to the programmer. Well, okay. One question is uh, how costly is this analysis? Um, well, that's it's a static analysis rule, so I, I, I never think about how it... Uh, if I'm intentionally running my static analysis, I never really consider that I care how long it runs personally, but I don't know how costly it is. Let's see, it has to it has to see if there's any inline assembly, it has to see if there's any throws state no, it has to see if there's any try statements, and it has to see if it is calling any other function that is not const expert. So it should not be terribly costly. It already is going to know if every other function call is const expert or not. Okay, well, it's an it's an interesting idea, and I, I think we've had we've gone through the process of uh, using the compiler as a static analysis tool. Because if if we look back at let's say uh, the F sharp language a couple of years ago, the way the whole language implemented its uh, static analysis is by effectively running the compiler kind of behind the scenes, and that was really slow. So uh, mm. I, I, personally, I think the the best solution is still to get the tool makers to do something about this, because that way, first of all, they will be able to figure out the performance implications, because some things are just too too costly to analyze, and it's it's sometimes sometimes you have cutoff points, so you have a certain depth to which you can analyze, and then you have to cut things off and not analyze further because because simply there 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 is no no CPU time anymore. So if if this is a trivial analysis, then I'm sure uh, the developers in let's say Reshop or C plus plus will implement this at some point. And the, if this is non-trivial, well we'll have to see. Maybe it can be a just a separate uh, static analysis stage that you can do uh, not related to compilation. So you might want to, let's say, run it on a continuous integration server and look at the results once a day and then adjust based on that. Right. Okay, well, uh, Dimitri, so a couple episodes back, we had uh, Kevin Henney on the show and talked a little bit about C++ design patterns. And I think you actually commented on that episode saying you actually uh, released a book recently on design patterns. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the book? Yes, I did. In actual fact, um, I wrote two books in parallel. So one on C++ and one on C Sharp. And uh, both of them are now published on LeanPub. But with the C++ book, what happened is I've been contacted by A-Press, which is a publisher. And so they are now the publisher of the C++ Design Patterns book. Now, 
Uh, the books themselves, they are based on uh, online courses that I made for uh, Udemy in this particular case. In actual fact, I have four of them. I'm covering C++, C Sharp, Swift, and Java. So uh, eventually, maybe all of these courses will become into books because for some people, it's more convenient to read than to watch. But I have both of these alternatives available. Interesting. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the topics you go over in the books? So essentially, uh, I'm going over the classic... Uh, design patterns from the Gang of Four book it, with very, very few modifications. It's actually interesting because if you think about, you might think that patterns would actually change from the 90s when the original book was published, but in actual fact, not much has changed. And further, if you look at all sorts of different programming languages, they all operate around pretty much the same set of patterns despite their differences in syntax and whatnot. And I think this is a testament to the fact that the original catalog of the design patterns is very robust. So in other words, it's it's a really good selection to begin with. So what I do in my books is I basically try to find all the latest ways, so all the kind of applications of the latest versions of the programming languages and how you can implement design patterns using those languages and what are the caveats and what are the alternatives, that sort of thing. So um, what do you see as the role of design patterns today in modern programming? Like, How should we be applying these things? Well, on the one hand, we have to state that design patterns, they're no longer some sort of panacea that once were. So there was a time when I was just starting out in the industry where you really needed to know design patterns like really well to pass a programming interview. And right now, you're kind of expected to know things at the general level. So if somebody, like, uh, you need to be able to figure out what a factory is, but it's, it's not so important anymore. And also, uh, you know, nowadays, for example, if we're talking about IDEs, you might come up to an IDE and it will give you an option to refactor a constructor into a factory method, for example, and you, you need to be able to know what this does basically. But in terms of using design patterns in programming, I think they're as relevant as ever. And it's just that we're not talking about them so much, which is okay because, well, I guess the hype has died down a little bit and we can just focus on applying them and obviously refining their uh, implementations uh, as new language features show up and we don't really see them as a silver bullet anymore so they're just a practical side of development overall and you know in my opinion uh, design patterns would make a great course as part of university education because uh, I mean currently the situation with the way that computer science is taught is in my opinion quite dire because nobody really focuses on the practical aspects and people do rudimentary programming they typically take I don't know the basics of Java they do have a data structures course but they don't learn what the industry needs and that includes things like how to debug how to profile code how to write unit tests and of course design patterns and and stuff like that so that's one area where I would be interested in maybe uh, seeing more uh, stuff related to design patterns. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I definitely agree. Universities uh, should be mo doing more to you know, train software engineers, not necessarily you know, computer scientists. Well, you see, uh, w w because I over a decade ago, I went through the, the sort of undergraduate computer science, and you get these subjects like uh, formal methods, for example. So essentially, on the one hand, it's part of computer science as an academic discipline. On the other hand, as you graduate, you realize that uh, the only way you're going to be using formal methods is if you go and work for NASA, which has a completely different kind of process for designing software. If you don't work for NASA, if you work for the 99.9 recurring percent of the industry, Industry, then all you've just learned is basically useless. So you can stay in academia and do even more work on, on formal methods, for example. You can go work for NASA or you can go and, you know, sort of work in the real world, so to speak. I want to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. PVS Studio is a static code analyzer that can find bugs in the source code of C, C++, and C Sharp programs. The analyzer is able to classify errors according to the common weakness enumeration, so it can help remove many defects in code before they become vulnerabilities. The analyzer uses many special techniques to identify even the most complex and non-obvious bugs. For example, data flow analysis mechanisms, which is implemented in the tool, has detected a very interesting bug in the Protobuf project. You can read about this bug in the article February 31st. The link is under the description of this podcast episode. 
The analyzer works under Windows, Linux, and macOS environments. PVS Studio supports analysis of projects that are intended to be built by such common compilers as Visual C++, GCC, Clang, ARM compiler, and so on. The analyzer supports different usage scenarios. For example, you can integrate it with Visual Studio and with SonarCube. The Blame Notifier tool can notify developers about errors that PVS Studio detects during night run by mail. You can get acquainted with PVS Studio features in detail on viva64.com. So do you want to give us some examples on uh, how newer C++ 14, 17 features affect some of the uh, design patterns that you go over in the book? Well, I have to say that in, in my book, I don't really focus much on language versions. So if I happen to use some later uh, you know, feature like make unique, for example, or if I make a basic string literal using the S both fix, I don't stop in the middle of a book and say, ha, here we're using C++14. And the same goes for library features, obviously. So if I use stdany or std optional, I'm not going to pause and, and sort of make a note of it. But obviously, all of these things, they make... Uh, sometimes they make the code concise. Sometimes they kind of uh, they significantly change the approach. But generally, I don't spend much time discussing uh, the implementation of patterns in earlier versions of C++ because, after all, the book is called "Design Patterns in Modern C++." So basically, I'm sticking to you know the latest version of the language available, and I'm using the latest language and the latest library to to implement uh, these particular patterns. It's also it's very difficult for me to distinguish because I don't have a mental recording of which C++ uh, feature comes from which version. I, I, I'm more practical. I have the liberty of using the latest, so obviously the latest production version. And so I don't, uh, I don't even catch that moment when I'm using something like, like some variadics with con constructor forwarding or fold expressions. I just use them because I, I know how they work, and that's pretty much it. So you just kind of assume that the readers will have at least some familiarity with uh, the newer C++ features? Well, yeah. I mean, it, I, I'm not making an introductory book here. I'm, right. I'm showing implementations of, of standard practices, and I, I will use whatever tool is available. So there's, there's plenty of literature on modern C++ as is, and people can look things up there. And obviously, plenty of wonderful screencasts online as well. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to complete the picture, so to speak. Okay, so if I'm I'm, I'm going to attempt to see if I can get a specific example from you, though, <clears throat> since you mentioned standard any, that was added in C plus plus seventeen. Um, some people, when they're exposed to it, they're like, "I this seems like a solution looking for a problem." They don't see the practical use case for standard any. And since you just mentioned it, is there any uh, particular use case in your design patterns book where you are using standard any that you could talk about? Well, yeah, I think uh, one one of the uh, locations where I'm using it is uh, when I'm talking about the interpreter pattern and the fact that, uh, well, let's say uh, you're trying to interpret a, uh, a programming language which, uh, you know, you have a class and the class can consist of various things like you can have a function inside it or you can have, a, let's say, a member variable inside it. And there are different ways of handling this variability. So you know that there's going to be a node in there or a collection of nodes of some type but you want to keep things flexible. So so there are different options here. One is obviously you would use inheritance. So you would have some base interface that both a function and a variable expose, and then they, they get stuck in here. But if you look at, uh, let's say, instead of hand-rolling the library, you decide to go for boost spirit, for example. So boost spirit is a library which just helps you build these parsers. And uh, boost spirit actually leverages static polymorphism. So in this case, instead of uh, defining some sort of base interface, you just have, uh, you, you have your any type and, and you know, then, then you write specific visitors so that you know how to actually traverse the whole thing, so to speak. So that's one example. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say is one of the most important things that a C++ developer should know about design patterns? Well, from the practical perspective, I suppose it just helps being aware of patterns at a high level because that way you kind of you recognize an opportunity to use a pattern later on. And there's really no need to memorize implementations, obviously, because honestly, that's what books and online courses are for. And you can always just go online and look up how someone has implemented this or that pattern and then decide if it's 
the right way for you. I will say this, though. There are situations where a pattern-first approach does, in fact, help. So, for example, let's suppose you're building an abstract syntax tree. Maybe implementing uh, the visitor pattern from the outset is a good idea because, y after all, you know that you're going to be traversing this tree. You might be uh, sort of traversing and collating uh, the elements of this tree into a string or something. So you can do this in advance. And the same applies to kind of uh, more general scenarios, shall we say. So let's say you've got a component which has a fluent interface. So you have methods which return this or return star this. Now, this is all well and good, but if you want other people to be able to inherit from this component and still preserve the fluent interface behaviors, this requires you to adopt a completely different approach to how the entire class is implemented. So these are some of the examples. So um, you already mentioned that uh, you have Udemy courses um, around other languages with the design patterns. And you said you, you uh, let me just make sure I got this right, Co um, Parallel wrote C Sharp and C++ versions of this book? Yes. Okay. Um, so in your experience of uh, working on these Udemy courses, uh, if I got this right, you have Swift, Java, C Sharp, and C++. Um, now, in, in early years, you said that you want to avoid like trying to compare languages, but I would like to invite you to compare languages right <laughs> now and say, where can C++ grow to make implementing software better compared to the other languages that you've worked with? Well, I think that uh, there are both advantages and disadvantages. So perhaps we can talk about the, the good stuff in C++ and then we can discuss some of the uh, stuff where it can improve. So in terms sure. of where pattern implementations are uh, better in C++, it's mainly to do with two things. So one is obviously multiple inheritance and this idea that uh, whenever you want to add functionality to a class, you don't have a situation where the base class is already taken and you have to mess with interfaces because you have multiple inheritance. And also, uh, you know, sort of as an add-on to this, uh, C++ actually allows you to inherit from a template parameter. And uh, this allows you to create a situation where you make an inheritance chain just by nesting several different templates typed together. And and then, of course, you know, the magic of C++ kicks in and you start doing all sorts of wonderful stuff. Like, for example, you've constructed this type, which like A for inheriting from B, inheriting from C, using this kind of uh, inheritance. What you can then do is you can uh, program your code so that if you pass this type constructor arguments, these constructor arguments are going to be distributed across all of the different base classes. A typical example would be that of a decorator pattern, for example. And to somebody not familiar with C++, this would just look like magic because nothing like this exists in C Sharp or Java. And in fact, you know, taking this um, uh, to a higher level, templates in C++ are a lot more powerful than uh, generics in other languages. I mean, things like periodic templates, for example, you only get them in C++. So, for example, in a language like uh, C Sharp, you know, your generic arguments, they... They need to be constrained in order to be usable. So if you you have a generic argument T, for example, uh, you can specify that it has to have an empty constructor, for example, but you cannot specify that the constructor actually takes one argument and that argument is an int. Now, in C++, obviously, without constraints and concepts, which I guess we're going to be get, getting in C++20, you can still use that constructor. And provided you feed it the correct type, it will work. Whereas in a language like C Sharp, that's not even a possibility. So you cannot, for example, just, just call an arbitrary constructor with two arguments. Unless, of course, you use reflection, for example. And of course, uh, you know, uh, C++, for example, it gives you more options with regard to managing the lifetime of the class generally. So you have the stack that gets cleaned up automatically, and you have the various smart pointers, which effectively ensure that as you kind of pass the object around, you, uh, you, it does what you want, and, and you also have things like deterministic destruction, which uh, if, if you have it, if you're used to it, you, you don't notice that, you know, it's... It, it, you don't notice that you're getting any benefits, but as soon as you jump to a uh, different language where, for example, a subscription to an event can actually generate a de facto memory leak because, uh, well, you have your, uh, you, you, you're keeping a reference to it and the garbage collector is kind of holding on to everything that you subscribe to and so on, and, and you don't have uh, deterministic control over it, and you end up building additional structures on top of that. That's something that, once again, this is uh, an illustration where C++ is great. On the other hand, yeah, there, there are lots of uh, places where C++ would really need to uh, kind of 
improve its game. Uh, I mean, the first is obvious. So from the perspective of just general usability, I'd say keeping the declaration and definition in a single file is probably my number one wish overall in C++. And I mean, this whole business of messing around with includes when you've got complex dependencies between types, it's a dark art, honestly. I, sometimes I, I have like a piece of paper and I draw the little arrows so that uh, I, I, I can figure out what depends on what, so then I can get get my includes correctly. So in this regard, like many other people out there, I do want modules, but unlike all those big corporations, I don't really care about where the macros are supported in modules anyway, because as I understand, that's that's what's kind of holding up the whole process. And I mean, it feels like if if we get modules, then the standard library would have to still require some sort of a rewrite, at least a partial rewrite, if, if modules are to be supported. And I mean, personally, I'm, I'm prepared to live without the macros. I can just, you know, take the macros. I don't need them. Uh, so uh, one, one more thing that we need is obviously libraries and, and library usability. Ideally, some sort of, I don't know, it, it seems like science fiction, but some sort of STL2 proposal that changes the way that APIs uh, of fundamental data structures so that they they're kind of more intuitive to you. So for example, if you look at the erase remove idiom, that's a good example of something that's completely wrong with C++. And because it's on a purely linguistic level, you expect erase to wipe the entire container. And if you look at erase in the C# -sharp containers, guess what it does? Yes, it erases all the contents of a container. But in C++ there is lots of this magic, uh, lots of these magic moments that you need to be aware of and I think that uh, especially for, you know, once again, get, getting people into the language, they're going to see this and they're going to think, oh my God, I have to keep a hundred, a hundred of these special cases in my head in order to be able to actually work with the language. Uh, what else? Well, reflection, obviously. So having reflection or at the very least some sort of metadata being published from types, this would allow, for example, proper unit testing instead of the, the kind of macro-based hackery that we get in Google Test and similar libraries. Uh, and reflection would also allow lots of little things like we have the prototype design pattern, which is all about copying objects. And if you have reflection, this allows you automatic serialization of plain C++ types, which means you don't have to write your own serializer code because reflection could go through, you know, all the uh, all, all the fields and it can serialize it automatically. So this is something that would simpli simplify, for example, the prototype design pattern. It will basically allow you to deep copy objects, including all of their dependencies. You'll just be able to take a type, serialize it, digitalize it in memory, and that's your copy, essentially. And and there's lots of other stuff, like in C Sharp, we're used to extension methods. So having extension functions in C++, that would be really cool. So basically, the idea is that, you know, you can take a type that's already defined, and you can give it additional members that lie elsewhere, uh, like on the side, for example. And then... There's been proposals in this area for a while now in C++. Uh, and, and this idea is also related to another interesting idea, which is partial classes. That's uh, the idea of being able to have the definition of a class in more than one file. And this allows you to, let's say, having uh, one part of a class that you wrote yourself and another part which is uh, made through code generation. And it's still the same class. And right now, the only way to do this in C++ is obviously uh, to use inheritance. So these are some of the examples I could go through more, but essentially I think that uh, the overriding idea is that uh, C++ designers and the committee, they should not be afraid to look at other programming languages and steal ideas from there because a lot of those ideas, they're already tried and tested, they work, it's, uh, it's, it's, there is no problem. And, and I mean, things like properties, for example, that, that's likely to start a holy war, but properties are really <laughs> useful. They're really useful, and we have these two camps. We have the, the sort of pragmatist camp that say, well, properties work in C Sharp, they work in Kotlin, they work in other languages, why not just have them? And we have the other camp, which is like the purity camp, and they're saying, well, you can do anything uh, using your own sort of library approach, just make a property type and, and work with that. So I, I'm more in the, in the pragmatist camp than the purity camp, I'm afraid. So uh, one of the comments that I, I actually never get this from students or very rarely, but I see often on Reddit or Twitter or whatever, is people saying basically that um, uh, C++ is willing to take any idea from anywhere and just glom it all together and the language is too big and complicated already. Now, 
Um, I'm not, just for the record, I'm not saying I disagree with you that we should be willing to adopt some of these other ideas, but do you have any comment about that? Like, do you think we risk making the language too complicated? Well, I think in C++, the, the story is not the same as with other languages. So, for example, take C Sharp. C Sharp is expanding, but it's still C Sharp. In C++, what we have is we have several parallel realities. We have the conventional C++ reality. We have uh, macros and things that you can build on top of them, like the boost preprocessor magic. We have the template uh the, the template reality where you can do a lot of things with template metaprogramming and whatnot. And I think it's really the problem is the spinning out of these additional realities, additional kind of chunks of the, the C++ universe, which don't exactly relate to one another. So you can, you can sort of, you, you can obviously mix and match. That's the whole point, but they, they kind of, they require to, you to know several different disciplines. So maybe on the one hand, the, uh, the language gets bigger, but I think that, uh, you still have to be pragmatic. If something is proven to work in another language, then why not take it? I mean, why not? One thing worth mentioning is, uh, I don't think we've talked about Herb Sutter's meta classes proposal in a while, but that's something that, you know, might be able to provide certain features from other languages, you know, like interfaces or, or properties, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's also a possibility. But, uh, once again, the, the thing with, uh, meta classes and the thing with, uh, this kind of what I would call proper metaprogramming, because template metaprogramming is a bit like hacking the preprocessor, but proper metaprogramming can be implemented in all sorts of different ways. And, and the way that, uh, many people see as the correct way is obviously exposing the compiler API. So essentially you can write a uh, meta definition, which takes an existing class and, for example, uh, using, uh, once again, uh, the compiler API goes through every field and generates an additional field for that field or something to that effect. So that's one approach. But if you look at the deep programming language, uh, the deep programming language doesn't mess around. It, 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 it doesn't bother with any of that. What it does instead is the following. It says, we're going to have this mixin instruction, which is like, like, it's going to be like a string returning function, but it's going to be called at compile time. And at compile time, whatever this string returns, we're just going to paste verbatim right in, inside the class and then compile the whole thing. And to me, even though this is kind of a brute force approach, uh, it seems like the most simple approach that people would actually use because it's a lot easier to understand the string than it is to understand, uh, for example, some specific uh because you need you need language constructs for mixing parts that uh you want to generate like for example if you want to generate a field this consists of uh, uh the fact that there is some data structure called a field there but also you have to provide it the name so you have this quasi quotation syntax and we've seen it in all sorts of languages on the .NET side as well and they, they are, I mean, it's a, it's a doable problem. It's a problem that you can implement. However, uh, it's complicated and it's a lot easier for most people. I would say 99% of people who actually want to use metaprogramming to sort of generate something at compile time, they would either, uh, just spit out a string and, and you, you know, you can spit out a string using something like what D gives you or simpler yet, yeah, you can use T4, for example, in Visual Studio, that's just a code generator. That's just something that you you can write instructions in C Sharp, and it spits out whatever you want. So it's a templating language. So I, I'm not sure about providing, you know, compiler-like APIs because, well, maybe I am mis kind of uh, <laughs> underestimating my fellow man, so to speak. <laughs> Okay, um, Dimitri, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we let you go? Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is it looks like your Udemy course is currently on sale if listeners are interested in checking that out. Well, Udemy's whole paradigm is that everything is always on sale all the time. <laughs> so that's that's how they make money. So pay no attention to to that. It's it's always, Courses are always there. And uh, I guess all, all I want to say is check out my courses, check out my books, and... Uh, you know, enjoy design patterns, and you know th these are these are relevant skills. The design patterns they they are always going to be popular. And surprisingly enough, I don't think that I think looking at this in ten or twenty years time, when we have C plus plus 
20 or C++ 30 or whatever, I think we're going to have the same catalog of patterns. I don't think anything is going to significantly change. Certainly what you see is you see some programming languages kind of uptake the patterns right inside the language itself. So for example, in the C sharp, that's obviously the observer pattern that's just been embedded into the language. But overall, I think the, the catalog that was was it 1994 when the original book was published? I think the catalog is as relevant and it will stay relevant in the future. Now, what I can do from my side is I can keep updating the books and I can keep uh, updating the courses so that if you look at C++, for example, you're always going to see the latest implementation. So as we get C++ 20, you, you're going to see maybe me using concepts whenever they are relevant. So that's my promise to you. <laughs> Okay, so we'll, we'll put a link to um, to both the original design patterns book by the Gang of Four and, and to your book. And if you're interested in learning about those design patterns with more modern coding examples, definitely uh, check out Dimitri's book. Okay, well, thanks for ha coming on the show again, Dimitri. All right, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.